Well, here we are on a Sunday morning in Wellington, about to hear from an Italian economist who's based in London, talk about China, among other things, and that is globalization in a sentence. No matter where you sit on the social scale, whether you're Bill Gates or a teenager with very few prospects growing up in South Auckland, you will have, we all have, an innate understanding that money makes the world go round. We don't really know what that means, we just know how that feels. This morning's guest understands money better than most, and in a different way than most. Loretta Napoleone has literally followed the money, tracking the funds of global terrorism and joining the dots. For someone who's worked in the money markets, she has uh, an uncanny ability to join the dots in ways that probably we're not that used to and that might be a little bit challenging. We're going to talk about that challenge this morning. In particular, uh, if we're talking about challenging and challenging perceptions, we're going to talk about her latest book. Loretta's latest book is called Maonomics, Why Chinese Communists Make Better Capitalists Than We Do. It's an interesting and challenging topic, but you'll find Loretta challenging in every way. Unless you've been living under a rock, you will know that everybody is talking about China. In barely 30 years, China has evolved from a closed shop into one of the fastest growing and increasingly influential economies in the world. And in that 30 years, China's economy has grown on average 10% a year. Now to put that into perspective, last year when China recorded just 7.7% growth, august media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal and The Economist ran concerned articles indicating that such low growth was triggering a degree of alarm. Now, in comparison, New Zealand's economic, or New Zealand's economy struggles to reach 2% growth, and according to our Prime Minister, that makes us a rock star. A number of European countries, of course, are basically broke. China's currently New Zealand's second largest trading partner. We were the first country to negotiate a free trade agreement with that country, as you will know. And whatever your views are on that agreement, New Zealand's closeness to China was one of the key buffers that protected New Zealand from the worst chills of the recent global financial crisis. So we have a lot of reason to look to China and to understand it, but we don't. Curiously, there is very little media coverage of events in China, and the country, its leaders, and its political system remain mysterious and little understood. In Loretta's book, she asks us to put aside our preconceptions about China and its form of government and to consider this. I'll quote. If I were an Egyptian today, which economic system would I want to emulate? The Western or the Asian? Would I trust Western leaders and corporations which for decades have been doing business with the oligarchical elite that oppressed and robbed me? Or would I look to politicians and firms from emerging countries People who, too, who, until a few decades ago, were as poor and dispossessed as I am today. It's quite a challenge. It's a big question, and we'll talk about that and more. Please welcome, very warmly, Loretta. Good morning. Good morning. Now, everyone um, who's sitting here has really not been listening to me. They've been doing what we do when we first see somebody for the first time. They've been eyeing you up mm -hmm. <laughs> and trying to work out what they think about you already. And the question that's probably whirring around the back of some of their minds, although they probably wouldn't be as impolite as to ask you, but what is a nice girl like you doing tracking the funds of terrorism? Well, this is um, actually a long story, but uh, I'll um, shorten it a bit. I had a friend when I was um, a child, uh, and we grew up together. And then she became a leader of the Red Brigades, uh, which is the armed organization 
that uh, shook Italy for 20 years in uh, the 60s and 70s. And of course I discovered it the day she was arrested. I had no idea that my dear friend was a member of the Red Brigades. And you know what I thought when um, I opened the newspaper and I saw her face? I thought, oh my gosh, why she never told me? But then I thought, why she never tried to recruit me? I mean, what's wrong with me? <laughs> so, so that thought stayed in my mind uh, for many, many years. We corresponded. Um, we never discussed, of course, uh, politics. Uh, and then in 1992, when the Red Brigades declared the end of the armed struggle, um, she um, said that she would like to discuss with me uh, why she became a member of the Red Brigades. Um, until then, uh, none of the members of the Red Brigades spoke with anybody, including their lawyers. So she put my name forward to the committee, and the committee said, OK, go and talk to her. So I had to change my job. I was working in the city in finance. I went back to university. I did a PhD in terrorism. And I spent four years going from one jail to another, interviewing all the members of the Red Brigades. And why didn't they recruit me? Because I didn't fit the profile. I was too opinionated, single-minded, and I would have been a very bad terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they told me. <laughs> so, so, uh, but when I was talking to them, all of a sudden, I remember I was having a conversation with uh, Mario Moretti, the guy who killed Aldo Moro, the Prime Minister of Italy. And all of a sudden, because I had worked in finance for so many years, I felt like I was back in the city of London having a conversation with a banker. Because this guy was expressing himself exactly in the same way, he was talking about money. And I thought, ah, maybe there is something more. I mean, how did this organization actually survive? Where did they get the money? What did they do? And so I started to investigate, and they were very, very happy to talk about that because they were extremely proud of how clever they were to raise the money. And this is how it all started. Until then, nobody had actually looked at the financing of terrorism because everybody was so concentrating on the ideology. But the truth is that the Red Brigades and all the other organizations I interviewed, um, the members uh, never actually discuss politics or ideology. They, the line comes from you know, the top, so you know, the leaders decide what the people think, because this is run like an army, and that's why I was bad for them. <laughs> but what the freedom that they have is all related to funding. They can do whatever they want to raise the money, because they have to, otherwise they can't survive. So it was like opening a new world, and it was very, very interesting. But how, how difficult was it to open that world? Because I guess from the comfort of our you know, comfortable chairs in our living rooms, we imagine that all of this is very clandestine, that this, it's very hard to track. Well, it, it, was, it wasn't difficult. I mean, it, I, when I was interviewing them, I had really serious problem in understanding why they did what they did in terms of ideology, because these people were really not very well versatile and educated in the ideological side of their organization. So Red Brigades were Marxists. Most of these guys never actually read a line that Marx wrote. <laughs> so they were all brainwashed, basically. But then when it came to money, of course, the situation was different. Um, and there, they could bring about their own creativity. And it's not true that most of the money actually were clandestine or you know, they, they raised money through illegal activity. A lot of money actually came from members of the families, um, friends, sympathizers. So a lot of money were actually clean money and, and work. They actually worked. I mean, although they were underground, they some of them, you know, had jobs. I mean, I remember once I interviewed a guy, that, he was a psychiatrist. <laughs> and he was... <laughs> so he was making a lot of money. Most of his money, of course, went to, to fund the organization. And he was also a keen sailor. He loved sailing, and he had this beautiful sailing boat. So, so he would sail to Lebanon from Italy, pick up the arms, uh, 
from uh, <laughs> PLO, bring them back to Sardinia and distribute these arms to the various arms organizations of Europe. This is all this guy by himself doing this. And he was so proud because he said, not only did I bring the weapons for us, but also I got paid for this job by ETA, by the IRA. And he was telling me this story. He was so proud of it. And I was fascinated because I thought, who would have thought that a psychiatrist, you know, keen sailor, would do something like that? I mean, you know, the image of the... The terrorist is something completely different. This was a perfectly you know, this nice person, and here it was. Ever since 9-11, um, we have, in, in the West, when I say we, the West um, it has been waging what's called the war on terror. Has that had any impact whatsoever, do you think, on their lines of funding? Not really. I mean, um, the, the, the one interesting thing about the funding is that um, the, the way they develop uh, how they fund themselves is always you know, a step ahead of the legislation. Uh, um, the war on terror really didn't tackle the funding. I mean, I was the chairman of the anti-terrorist uh, financing committee for you know, the Club de Madrid, so I did a lot of work on that topic. And unfortunately, we failed tremendously because the legislation that was introduced, the Patriot Act, uh, did not tackle the problem. The Patriot Act went after the dirty money, but didn't actually consider you know, the clean money. Um, it's very difficult to, to go after the clean money, because of course this money are clean until the moment in which they're used for a terrorist attack. But this is where we should actually have done something. Um, in the case of um, Al-Qaeda, for example, um, the bulk of the money came from sympathizers and supporters from the Gulf. Uh, those were money earned through different businesses. So how do you stop that kind of money? Uh, they, there are ways, of course, but they're, they're different from the Patriot Act. <laughs> there are ways whereby you, know, you, you try to penetrate the organization and you try to infiltrate the organization, but this is something that takes a very long time, a completely different strategy. Well, the Patriot Act took uh, uh, basically a couple of days. They had it ready and that was it. Um, so if you look at what happened after 9-11 and after um, also the invasion of Iraq, we had the birth of new organization, uh, for example, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, who didn't exist before. And today is still a very active organization. Um, we didn't even think about that. And this is all related to the Patriot Act, because the Patriot Act basically blocked the smuggling of drugs from um, South America to the US to Europe uh, and created a new route uh, which and this route was from South America to West Africa up you know to Europe and of course this organization was able to tap into that business which is a massive massive business and fund itself and then created um, gave itself the name of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Now these people have no contact with Osama bin Laden, they never met anybody, they simply emulated what Al-Qaeda had done. So this is one of the consequences of legislation which are introduced without thinking about what would happen, because they were introduced by people that didn't really understand how the funding um, works, and frankly they didn't even care because their objective was something else. It was to, to stage a war in Iraq, which it did. You're touching on um, um, the attitude of the West to some of these um, really difficult global issues, and that is a nice segue, in a way, uh, to your latest book about China. Um, it, it, I was interested in the, at the end of the book, you say that you almost called it Marx One. Mm. Yes. Well, the, actually, that's the, the title in Chinese. Uh, the Chinese love that title. They <laughs> <laughs> read it. Chinese, that's the title. Uh, the, uh, in the West, um, when I said Marx, I said, oh, no way, no way. Yeah, nobody's going to buy a book with Marx written on. So, okay. So they said Maonomics. And I said, but you know, this is not a book about Mao. If anything, this is a book about Deng Xiaoping. Oh, nobody knows who Deng Xiaoping is. 
I thought, okay. So that's, <laughs> that's why. But the truth is that, yes, the book is Marx 1 to a certain extent because it is um, an application of the Marxist uh, theory um, exactly as I think you know, Marx would have liked it uh, because Marx wrote uh, in a historical period that, of course, uh, doesn't exist anymore, but the principles can be applied and adapted to a different uh, situation. Um, the difference between China and the Soviet Union is, is that the Chinese were able to adapt the system, and they're still adapting it. And that's why I call it Kami, com, um, Kavi communism. Um, it's capitalism, but in a communist society. Um, well, in the Soviet Union, uh, the system was too rigid, uh, so it collapsed, it broke into uh, many little pieces. Uh, and look at the difference today between Russia, I think this is quite topical actually, mm -hmm. the difference between Russia mm -hmm. and, and China. Here we are putting, you know, invading <laughs> um, the Ukraine, we are putting, bullying basically the West, we have a major, major problem inside you know, Russia related to the inequalities, we, we have 110 um, billionaires who actually own um, about 43% uh, of the wealth of the nation. I mean, it's just like the czarist system uh, all over again. And look at China. I mean, China is actually doing very well. He has lived um, hundreds of million people from uh, poverty and starvation. I mean, the, the World Bank report, the last World Bank report says that the only reason why poverty has gone down in the world in the last 20 years is because of China, because everywhere else has gone up. So I think we should think about these realities. And so, yes, I think it, was, it is still a very successful story. And the West have thought about it, though, and... Um, the, this kind of economics that you call capi communism. I guess the perception from the West has been that um, where China has adopted some form of capitalism, that really just vindicates the fact that the West was right all along and that the Western values um, were the ones that actually grow economies and lift people out of poverty. Yeah, but you know, the truth is that uh, Marx never said that capitalism was wrong. On the contrary, I mean, if one reads uh, uh, the capital, the capital is all about the triumph uh, of a system which is based upon industrial production. What he said, he, he said that the ownership of this capitalism should not be in the hands of very few people, but should be in the hands of the masses. So th there is a, a misconception, I think, uh, in the West, uh, which considers Marxism uh, as the enemy of capitalism. I mean, Marx never wanted to go back to an agrarian society, on the contrary. So it is because, of course, the propaganda, um, and then you know, we had uh, the supply side economics, we had you know, a lot of people that went straight against the concept of Marxism, ident identify Marxism with the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union was not Marxist at all. It was a totalitarian regime run by a small elite of incompetent individuals, and this is why you know, it happened what it happened. And I would say today that Russia is uh, it, the same today. It, it is uh, uh, an oligarchic society run by a bunch of incompetent people, the oligarchs, uh, and by you know, an individual, Putin, who actually thinks he is the new czar and is heading for the same kind of disaster. That's uh, nothing to do, nothing to do with true capitalism uh, and nothing to do with Marxism. In China, on the other hand, uh, you still you see that the ownership of most of the important strategic um, assets of the state is in the hands of the people, although there is private property. Now, the Central Bank of China owns uh, the, the banking system. There is no private banking. Finance is not uh, um, privatized in the same way it is in the West. Um, there are certain kind of barriers to hot money flying into China, you can't do. So there is a certain kind of protection from the dark side of capitalism. And I think it works, it works very well. But that doesn't mean, of course, that the, the Western model um, 
is a triumph in China. I would say that the Western model in China has been adapted through an analysis, which is a Marxist analysis, to a society uh, that is a very peculiar and particular society, and it works very well. We, we can't take the model and then apply a, in Italy, for example. It, it wouldn't work because the circumstances are different, because the countries are different. But we can do the same thing that Chinese have done, make an effort to adapt the model to our own circumstances. But no, we don't. We just have one single model and we replicate it and it's a disaster. The pivot point um, you identify early on in the book um, for the Chinese economy was uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And again, this is an event which interpreted through Western eyes was seen as a triumph of Western values. Mm -hmm. You don't see it that way. No, absolutely. I, I think it, it wasn't a, a triumph of Western values at all. I also think that he took the West by surprise. Nobody really believed that it was going to come down so quickly. This is why we didn't have a plan of action in order to, what are we going to do now? Um, I mean, I, I wrote another book which is called Rogue Economics where I describe the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, absolute poverty and uh, the destruction that took place, including you know, Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, I think the Chinese were very attentive. I mean, 1989 is a key year for, for China, and I think it has been badly interpreted by, by many um, analysts, uh, because all we remember about China in 1989 is, of course, Tiananmen Square. But we do not remember what actually uh, led to, to Tiananmen Square and what happened after. In fact, you know, at the beginning of the book, I talk about that uh, extensively. Because in reality, Tiananmen Square was something that the Communist Party, in particular Deng Xiaoping, had to do in order to save the program of opening up to the West, so to absorb the the elements of capitalism which China needed in order to industrialize. It was a sacrifice, of course. It was a terrible, difficult, difficult decision. But it was a decision of the general to say, um, I can sacrifice the few in order to save the many. Because otherwise, you know, I will lose every, everything. But the West looked at that as, you know, the biggest possible bridge on human rights. And we, even today, still look at China through that lens. And that's why all the left-wing parties of, of Europe never related to China at all. This is also why communism as an idea, ideological idea, collapsed completely in the West. It was not because of the Berlin War, it was because of what Deng Xiaoping did in that square. Um, so the consequences of that action are were disastrous for us, uh, and not for China. Because by 1991, Deng Xiaoping was able to reconquer the control of the party. He was able to start the economic, new economic zones. So he was able to reinvent the opening up that had not worked in the 1980s and do it properly. And from that moment onwards, you know, China has been on the rise. Those special economic zones, I, think, um, I, I don't think many New Zealanders would understand those really because so little was said about them at the time. But these were, th this was a part of China that was opened up for yeah. well, basically investment. What, what, yeah, basically what happened is this, that Deng Xiaoping um, got control of the party, became you know, the, the leader after the death of Mao. It took him two years of it fight inside the party. And Deng Xiaoping had actually studied um, as most of the leader, apart from Mao, in the West. Uh, he, um, he spent a lot of time in France, and he had worked for two years at the Renault, Renault factory in France. So he was very, very keen on experimenting on capitalist model. Um, and this is also why he was purged during the Cultural Revolution. So his idea was uh, we're going to create uh, um, a market uh, where we have you know, two different um, 
realities. One is, you know, the state-owned market. So the farmers would bring, you know, their products as, you know, was the model to the state-owned market. But then part of uh, what they produce could be also sold privately. So that created a two-tier market, uh, which was a disaster because eventually there was widespread inflation. In order to do that, also, in order to uh, slowly move the state control economy into a free economy, what Deng Xiaoping um, did was start to reduce the sort of you know, social security system. So at the time, basically everybody had a bowl of rice, a, a roof over their head, and a job. So it started to reduce some of these, uh, um, we we'll call it privileges, uh, which created a lot of unrest. So the combination of inflation and, of course, reduction of social security created a massive uh, you know, uprising, and that's his Tiananmen Square. It was not democracy. They didn't want democracy. This is the, the way that the propaganda, let's not forget that we're still in 1989. We're still in the, at the very end of the Cold War. The propaganda of the West made us believe that what these people wanted was democracy. These people didn't even know what democracy was. The concept of democracy in China is totally different. If you read Mao's speeches, he often, often mentions democracy as a completely different meaning from our democracy. So the situation was getting out of control inside the party. Deng Xiaoping was not controlling anymore the different parts of the party. They did not want this opening up. So the decision was taken that he had to repress Tiananmen Square, go back to the drawing board, and study a way to open up slowly. And this is the new economic zones, basically. So the idea was we create enclaves, uh, and inside these enclaves, uh, we basically introduce a free capitalist system. No taxes, no regulation, nothing. What do we have to offer to the world so that we attract capitals and people will come and produce here instead of producing at home? Cheap labor. So cheap labor came from the countryside, so people were allowed to travel to this uh, economic zone because, of course, until then, if you were born in the countryside, you stayed in the countryside. There was no movement. Uh, there was no labor mobility. Uh, so, so this was the experiment. And the idea was, if it works, fantastic. If it doesn't work, that's it. We'll close the zone, and that's done. So we're not going to have the same kind of problem uh, nationwide that we had today. And that was the idea. And it worked incredibly well. And you may say, oh my gosh, those people were exploited. But those people were able to save enough money to go back home and start their own business. It's like the Industrial Revolution. It's the same thing. If you read the chart Dickens, uh, it's the same story all over again. People were starving in the countryside. They managed to get to the factories, and they could feed themselves. Uh, and through the exploitation, save enough money to go back home uh, and start their own business. One of the other effects of the, of the Special Economic Zone and, and the policy of cheap labour is that um, worldwide, there's just been a tsunami of redundancies and factory closures, as factories all over the world couldn't compete with the cheaper goods provided or produced by those cheap Chinese workers. Yeah, I mean, you will pay the consequences of all of that, to be honest, is us. I mean, if you look uh, at labour, um, trends uh, of uh, salaries, for example, we see that, you know, the, in terms of purchasing power parity, so how much you know, your salary is actually buying you every day, uh, we went down in the West because, of course, it was so much cheaper to produce there. That, so to compete with, um, <laughs> with the production in China, um, you had to cut the cost of labor, and cutting the cost of labor means you know, to reduce uh, you know, salaries uh, in real terms. Um, it was inevitable. It was, and, and of course, the West, uh, the Western leaders, the Western government, didn't even think about that because they were not interested. The great thing about China that at the time in the 90s was, oh my gosh, you know, we can produce a rock bottom prices in China, do a good product because you know the Chinese are actually very good if they're 
initially they had to be supervised, but now they should do it by themselves. Um, and uh, we can increase our profits without thinking that by doing that, uh, you are exporting know-how, you are exporting uh, knowledge, uh, skills uh, to another country, and by doing that, you are losing that asset. Italy is, is an amazing example. I mean, most of the Italian fashion industry is not produced in Italy anymore. Uh, I mean, we have in certain uh, parts of Italy, in the south, we have 50% youth unemployment. And these people have no skills whatsoever. And 30 years ago, um, the equivalent of that generation was employed in small factories producing shoes, producing handbags. And now, all that business uh, is gone to China. So effectively, there's been a transfer of work. Absolutely. Wealth, well, jobs it's, and wealth. Yeah, it's been an industrial revolution. Same thing. I mean, industrial revolution. Um, uh, the first, the first industrial revolution. Uh, you, you see, all of a sudden, that 75% of the GDP of the world is produced in the United Kingdom, in particular in England, and now that 75%, slowly but surely, is is moving back east. I mean, before the industrial revolution. Uh, 70% of the GDP of the world came from China and India, because, of course, they were countries rich of resources. Um, and so isn't the logical progression of this that, um, that uh, you know, as the middle class grows in China and, and as the, um, the, the sort of next wave of, in China's history will be that, uh, you know, workers will demand and seek better yes, conditions, yeah, and yeah. then the corporations that are, yeah. have dr driven down the price of labour in order to make greater profits will simply move their labour force to yeah. Africa. I mean, to a, to a certain extent, they've done that yeah. with India already. Yeah. Well, but that's the, the, that's, the final, that's the final frontier of capitalism. It is resources uh, and cost of production. We haven't got there yet, but we will. Eventually, we will. Um, but hopefully, you know, by then uh, we will have a new economic theory, I hope so, because otherwise what's going to happen? Although, although you may get into a cycle and that's the danger and that's what we're seeing in, in the south of Europe and, and also in some parts of the US, North Mexico, for example, um, in order to compete, uh, uh, you may have a deflation, so you have an impoverishment of certain regions uh, to a point in which the labor cost uh, will be so low that it will be in competition with you know, the cheaper labor costs in other parts. So, you know, its number one competitor of China in terms of cheap products uh, is actually Mexico. In north of Mexico, um, and most of the factories are owned by Northern uh, Americans, so Canadians uh, include also, and um, Americans, but many Italian, big Italian industrialists have moved there. So there is, you know, along the border, there is this sort of belt, industrial belt, uh, where they produce uh, almost everything that is produced in China at rock bottom prices. The degree of exploitation is incredible. Um, there is a lot of crime, of course. There is uh, um, mostly are women who are employed. And, um, and that's a very, very, very poor area. And, and most of the region is controlled by the cartel, who actually gets a cat out of, out of this business. So you may see a situation like this uh, taking place in Western countries or in countries that are um, more developed uh, um, than, um, of course, uh, not anymore China, but you know, Vietnam, for example, Laos, uh, uh, Cambodia. This is where most of the offshoring uh, and outsourcing of production is taking place in Asia. Um, so that's the real danger, is this impoverishment. Because at the end of the day, if you look at countries like in Southern Europe, uh, you know, Greece, Italy, Spain, we have no resources, nothing. I mean, we're not rich countries. Our resources was actually the manufacturing, but the manufacturing now is done somewhere else. So it's a serious problem. Given the um, economic transformation of China and um, the fact that at the moment, I mean, they have trillions of dollars in mm. cash reserves, which is something no other country can claim, um, can you explain why it is that the West hasn't really engaged with China? 
I mean, I mentioned we've got a free trade agreement, agreement with China, as we do. So there's an a economic transactional relationship with China, but it doesn't really go beyond that. Oh. Well, I, I, I think you know, one of the key issues is um, that the West does not, does not understand China. I mean, China is the great mystery. Um, it's very, very different uh, from us, uh, 5,000 years of civilization. Think about, you know, China was there at the time of the pharaohs. <laughs> it's still there. So for us, it's very difficult to relate uh, to a civilization that is so ancient. And also for them, uh, it's very difficult to take us seriously. That's another important element. The Chinese uh, are incredibly proud of themselves. Uh, they, they don't have the same arrogance that we in the West, the so-called colonizer, have. But the Chinese uh, do feel superior in terms of history because they have 5,000 years of history behind them. So I think that's the first major problem. You know, we speak two different languages and we can't communicate. Um, the other problem is, of course, that China is um, resisting uh, the opening up of its economy totally to the Western model. So um, in terms of finance, uh, you see there is a continuous pressure on China to revalue the Ravimbi. They want, of course, the Ravimbi to be convertible, but China is not doing it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not interested in that. It will do it when it's ready, and it will do it when uh, there will be a new international monetary system. Because with this system, uh, the Chinese are sure that they would be in a major crisis as it happened in the Asian uh, market crisis at the end of the 90s. They have learned a lesson watching what happened to countries like Thailand or Malaysia. I mean, you open up the market, you make your currency convertible, and today that there are so much money. You have no idea how much money there are in the world today because they've been printing like crazy also. You have a massive flow of money, hot money, moving into your market that will create inflation, of course, and then eventually bubbles, and then the bubble will burst, and then all this money, as quickly as they come in, they will go out. Now, the Chinese are very conscious of that, and that's why they're not doing what the West wants. And of course, the West wants that market to be open up financially, because imagine how much profits could you make if you could freely invest in Chinese enterprises, but that's prohibited. So that creates tension between, between the two. And, and the, the reaction of the West is, well, if you don't do what we tell you to do, if you do not open up the market the way we have opened our market, you will fail. And this is why since 2009, you know, periodically you get top economists saying, China's going to fail, China's going to fail. Oh, you know, the, the rate of growth is not going to be enough. And look, I mean, China has been growing uh, in the midst of this major, major crisis uh, at seven, uh, between 6.8 and 8%. And uh, what has happened in the West? Major recession, no growth. So, you know, I, I think we have to stop thinking about when China will fail and start thinking about our failure. And that's why I wrote that book. Why are we saying, oh, you're, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, while you yourself are failing? Don't you think it's more important to think about why are we failing than, you know, waiting for somebody else? I'm sure that um, since the book um, came out, you've received a fair amount of flack about it. I mean, there'll be many people who read that book and think that you're just a Chinese apologist. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I just... Um, <laughs> I heard uh, just about everything, basically, about myself. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and the best was, um, <laughs> of course, you know, when uh, the, in two, uh, last year, before the, the party committee and the election, of course, of the new leader, they, the, the party drew a list of the hundred books that everybody, uh, every member of the Communist Party should read. And of course, here it was, my book was there. So you can <laughs> imagine you know, what happened when that, you know, said, oh, so this is true, you know, she is you know, a communist and blah, blah. But I also got a lot of um, prizes. I mean, this book won a lot of um, 
um, prizes. It, it, it was the best business book uh, in Singapore, for example. It was, you know, the best. Uh, oh, even in Italy, believe it or not, uh, I won two prizes. <laughs> so I mean, so uh, it's a book, book that really polarizes um, the debate um, uh, on China. But well, it's challenging. You it are is. very yeah, challenging of the Western way of thinking. Yes, and, and you see, the reason why the West is uncomfortable with me is because I'm not Chinese, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually coming from the West. And that is, I think, the real problem. I mean, if, if I were Chinese from Singapore or you know, Malaysia or whatever, it, it would have been easier to accept because, of course, uh, come, I would come from a different background. But I was educated uh, in, um, in the top universities in the West. So um, how is it possible that somebody like me uh, says these things about China and the West? It's, it's uncomfortable. Do it's you uncomfortable. Um, have any optimism that uh, the West will be able to change the way it perceives China? No. I am very pessimistic, actually. No, because it's just... It, it's not within our nature. If you look at history, we, we have failed time and time again to understand the major changes in, um, in the world. Uh, and this is why we fought two world wars in, in the last century. Um, I don't think that we do have the kind of humility that is required to understand what is happening in the world today. Look, we created globalization because we wanted to extend our power, and he became a boomerang. And now globalization is actually working against us. How did we do that? How did we go so wrong? So, no, I'm, I'm fairly pessimistic, actually, about, you yeah, We assumed that with globalization, we assumed that, I mean, this was the Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher yeah. um, core belief, really, was that if markets opened up, that consumers in those developing countries would buy the Western-style goods, and with them, they would buy democracy. But you know, this is a colonialist mentality. This is the mentality of the colonizer, because you know, this is the idea that we will be always the one that control the means of production. We will always be the one that control what we produce, and the others will be the one actually who are going to buy. It's the same thing with colonization. I mean, I enslave like, another country to my own economy, and, um, and I reap the benefits of it. Well, it doesn't work like this if you have democracy. <laughs> You have to have a totalitarian regime to do that. Um, That's a particular challenge to New Zealand, actually, because um, we have got this very close relationship, trading relationship with China. And um, I mean, I've interviewed, and I couldn't say how many um, businessmen over the years about China. Mm -hmm. And the thing that uh, they almost all say is, you know, it's so many billion customers or so many billion consumers. So yes. the, the, the relationship is seen from the get-go and right through as a simple transaction between me, the producer, and them, yeah, the potential I mean, I think consumers. That this, this is the danger. I, mean, I think that the free trade agreement was a very good idea because you, know, you, you are here. I mean, geographically, um, it makes sense to trade with China. China is in need of your products. But you must be very, very careful to maintain uh, um, control over what you're producing and also control over the relationship because in no time at all China could take you over. I mean, I'm not saying in terms of military invasion, I, I say in terms of commercial dependency. You don't want to become a rentier state, you don't want to become a market that only sells to one customer and that then customer will owe you. And, and it is dangerous because New Zealand is a country that has a certain kind of resources that everybody will want in the next uh, you know, 100 years. You have water, you have food, so only 4 million people, so there is plenty of land. Um, we're not talking about Africa, we're talking about a civilized Western countries. So there is uh, uh, the rule of law, there is democracy. I mean, this is an ideal, an ideal environment. 
for countries like China or, the, uh, or even Saudi Arabia. Of course, you have no agreement with Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia is doing the same thing that China is doing in other parts of the world, which are countries that they have a um, shortage of food and water um, to penetrate. Um, you know, another country that is in this same situation, similar, is Canada. And, and China has been doing a lot of business uh, with Canada. Canada also has, apart from the oil and gas, Canada also has water and it has vast land that can be farmed. Um, I think we have to, we need a cultural shift. Uh, and this is why I'm pessimistic, because this cultural shift in the West is not taking place. We must realize that the oil of the future is going to be water and food. <laughs> which are going to be more important than what you put in the tank of your car. Because if you don't eat, you're not going to need a car. <laughs> um, so it's going to be the, the really the top of the top of the list. Um, uh, so a country like this, I think, can be incredibly rich, can uh, be very well positioned, but you have to be careful because you're not dealing uh, with, I mean, to a certain extent, you're making you know, deals with the devil, because that's what it is. They want something from you. They're not, they, they're not trading with you because they want to improve uh, the commercial uh, relationship. They're trading with you because they want what you have, and they will want more and more and more of what you have. Fascinating. Um, let me take some questions from the audience. I now those of you that have been here before will know that we have microphones, so um, the gentleman in the middle. And I'll, c I'll come to you next, sir. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it's incredibly interesting. Uh, it's just a pity that it's on at 9.15. Um, <laughs> I just wonder if you were supporting the, the, the conservative system, whether you'd be at this, this time. Uh, look, um, what, you've mentioned China. What about the United States? What's their role? And what, how should we approach them? Because we have, many people think that we've, uh, oil people think we've got a lot of, lot of oil. You only have to look around the world to see what happens to countries that can't look after themselves. What happens to them? What do you, what's your uh, position on that with New Zealand? Yeah, you mean, what's the position between uh, New Zealand and the US? Huh? Yes, yes. Yeah. How, how do we have to watch them? Yeah, okay. Let me say that, you know, I did suggest that everybody should, should have a, an espresso coming into this theater this morning, but we couldn't provide that. Uh, we'll do it like next time. Um, um, I, um, I think the U.S., uh, to be honest, is not any more um, a big problem uh, as it was in the past. I think the U.S. is going through a major decadence uh, in terms of um, political role. Uh, um, I was thinking about what, how Obama has handled all of these different crises, and, uh, and some people praise him for diplomacy, but the truth is that in Syria people are butchering each other, <laughs> and then in the Ukraine uh, and Crimea, uh, Putin's troops are there in 2008, uh, Putin managed to do the same thing in Georgia. So really, uh, I think the U.S. is so busy with its own it's almost like you know, the U.S. has gone back to that Monroe Doctrine, uh, you know, American for the Americans, so it's just closing in. Um, of course, the oil dependency is, is a big dependency. I would uh, say that a country like New Zealand uh, should invest heavily, absolutely heavily, on renewable resources. Because this is something... I mean, this is really something that you can do because you have immense, immense uh, um, opportunities uh, for these resources, uh, you know, from uh, wind, solar, uh, to uh, the, <clears throat> the ties up to um, transformation of organic waste uh, I mean, into energy. I mean, think about, you know, all this farming now that you're doing. Uh, I was reading about... Uh, the, the Chinese investing heavily <coughs> in dairy products. I mean, all the organic waste can be transformed into energy. Um, and that, 
in New Zealand can do it because small population, small consumption in comparison to other countries, vast land, um, I would definitely, definitely invest heavily into that. And I bet that you can even get uh, Chinese money to invest into that because the Chinese, I, I have two chapters on renewable resources in China. The Chinese are very, very involved in renewable resources. They are the largest producer, for example, of solar, solar panels in the world. So you may even get agreements on that. Um, another question. So if I'll take the gentleman at the end, yeah, sorry, there, and the next one, just for the person with the microphone, is this gentleman in the second row here with the brown jersey on. Yep. Thank you very much, um, Doctor, for that great talk. Uh, I'm very much interested in relation to um, social, the use of social capital. Uh, if we do have the opportunity to use um, resources, as in hydroelectric, or your um, the concept of social capital, we could make that transition into renewables. So um, in terms of following America, as the last speaker said, what's your view about um, what's really holding us up to a transition to the next stage? Is it the media? Is it the fact we're in the grip of a strange compulsion? And um, why can't we make this transition to social capital and use even superannuation funds or things that are at the moment not being used under that category? Well, I think it's a, it's a cultural problem. It's what I was saying before. We need a cultural shift. We need, we need a new paradigm. And um, we're not ready for, for it. Um, it's still cheaper to import oil. Uh, it's still cheaper to import, even you know, burn coal. I mean, the cheapest source of energy still today is coal. So we, we, we need to look ahead. And in that, the Chinese are so much better than us because the Chinese plan 50 years you know, ahead. 12 years plan for China is a short-term plan. <laughs> We're lucky if we get a politician that can look you know, beyond six months. So um, we need a, a major shift. Um, and we also need um, the state to participate um, with private investment in order to bring about the social capital. Because the, the private industry does not have the kind of money for a, um, a major industrial reconversion from hydrocarbon to renewable resources. But also, um, the private industry doesn't see the, the profit in doing that. Because again, it's a short-term kind of way of running. Um, and, an industry. Um, the politicians have to step in. Uh, this is definitely a decision that has to come at a political level. Uh, how do you convince the politicians? Uh, huh, I wish I known, but this is, a, again, this is a small country, four million people. Uh, I bet you have a more direct contact with your politician mm -hmm. than we have in, in countries like the United Kingdom where there are 60 million people. So the, it is a movement that perhaps has to start from the bottom up and it can be done, absolutely. Um, and there is a window of opportunity to do it now, definitely. Um, doing it too late is not going to work, but now is the time to do it. I'm, on that, actually, I must say, I'm fairly optimistic. I think it is possible to do it. All right, the question here. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed your talk greatly. Um, we, can or will China change? Um, the West needs trade. Uh, traders must be able to enforce contracts. That means the rule of law and an independent judiciary an independent judiciary as opposed to a party power structure. This surely is the crunch point which has to be addressed. And people looking for a bright, bold future in China really may be waiting a very long time uh, if there's any, any resolution at all to that problem. Thank you. Well, I, it's um, very good that you said that because 
there is again another misconception about China. People think that China is a sort of you know, far west where there is no law. In fact, it's actually the opposite. The rule of law, and I discussed this in the book, the Chinese are very, very sensitive to the rule of law. Um, and that's the difference between our democracies. I mean, we valued more democracy than the rule of law. The Chinese are not interested in democracy, but they are really interested in the rule of law. So the, the system actually works uh, fairly well. Um, you may say, oh well, um, there is so much corruption. There is corruption everywhere. There is corruption in New Zealand, there is corruption in Italy. I mean, corruption is endemic, is part of the human nature. Um, but I don't think that there is more corruption in China than there is you know, in, in other countries. But at least in China, if you get caught, you get punished. In Italy, if you get caught, you don't get punished. Well, you become prime minister. You become prime minister. <laughs> I, I know this sounds crazy, but if I were a young... I mean, if I were a young Chinese, I'd say, you know, I'm a 15-year-old Chinese and I'm a 15-year-old Italian. Um, I think the 15-year-old Chinese uh, has a better sense of the rule of law in his own country. He's more afraid of the rule of, of law in his own country than the 15-year-old Italian. The 15-year-old Italian is completely disillusioned about the rule of law in Italy. So that is important because this is part of the decadence of the West, I think is the fact that we do not believe any longer in our own legal system. That not only we accept corruption as an inevitable consequence of human beings, but we also accept the fact that most of the time you don't get caught if you are corrupted or if you corrupt somebody. I think that is really um, something... I, I'd rather have no democracy but rule of law than democracy without rule of law. Because people need to be responsible for their own action. Um, so I know it's very difficult because the propaganda, I mean, because of what you read in the newspapers, uh, oh, well, you know, the, the, the Chinese court of law. Well, you should read about the Italian's court of law. <laughs> but uh, this doesn't make any. Uh, I don't know if you if you got news about Berlusconi, all the trials yeah. that he had, all yeah. stuff. But it's not only Berlusconi. Look, for example, Amanda Knox. Now everybody mm. has followed that story, right? So Amanda Knox was found guilty, then was found not guilty, mm. and now there is another trial where you know, they found the guilty again. You know, double jeopardy. Have we heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> but and this is happening in a civilized uh, member of the European Union. I mean, think about, and that could happen to any of your children. Any of your children that go and study in Italy may actually be among the Knox. Would you like something like this to happen? No way, no way. I wouldn't send you know, one of my kids to study in Italy, and I'm Italian. <laughs> I wouldn't. So answer the question that you put in your book, which I started the session with, about if you were, let's say, if you were a young Egyptian today, mm. would you look to the West or would you look to the East? No, I would look to the East, absolutely. I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, I wrote a book about the um, yeah, insurgency in Egypt, which was not actually, I don't think it's translated in English, that book. But, um, and I interviewed a lot of those young people that were... Uh, uh, in uh, Takfir Square, um, and they were all looking at the Asian model. Also very popular is Singapore. Um, very popular is the, the model of Singapore, which is a sort of enlightened uh, um, dictatorship, if you want to call it like that, mm. or monarchy. Um, so the democratic model of the West uh, is not at all the model that these people want. Um, be, because they've seen this model fail. I mean, let's not forget that uh, we're talking about uh, a situation 
uh, related to a major disaster, not only financially but also politically in Europe since 2010. I mean, the Egyptians know how the EU has handled the sovereignty um, debt crisis, uh, uh, what have done to, to the Greek, what have done to the rest. I mean, and, and even today, imagine if you're an Egyptian today and you're reading the news about uh, what is uh, Europe doing and the US to stop Putin uh, doing what it's doing. Nothing. So uh, I think uh, the Egyptian would feel very scared. By the system. I promised that you would be challenged. Uh, we've had our minds sort of twisted and turned and popped this morning. Uh, it's a great way to start a Sunday and um, I'd ask you <laughs> to um, join me in thanking Loretta Napoleoni. <laughs>